Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to our entrepreneurship track. Um, we're now moving on to talk about revenue generation um, because as much as the community is fabulous, um, everyone does need some income generation to be able to, uh, to survive and, uh, and to reinvest in their proposition as well. So really important topic, uh, particularly in this entrepreneurship room. I'm Eleanor Shaw, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Strathclyde Business School. Um, we're a technical university, we're the UK's first technical university and we do lots and lots um, with early stage ventures, including tech ventures, but not just tech ventures. And I think we've probably supported now about 600 um, at all different stages from startup all the way through to uh, securing funding, whether that is through venture capital or bootstrapping and um, going on to scale, um, including internationally, which is really important for open, I think. Um, so what I'll do is I'll introduce you to the panel in a moment. We'll have about half an hour of discussion um, invite you to ask us questions. Of course, if while we're discussing, you've got a question that you'd like to ask, just put your hand up and somebody, I wonder where our love yes. So we've got um, Beth. Beth up the back there who will, who will be exhausted by the end of today because she's been running around the room um, with, uh, with microphones. If you do want to ask a question, if I could please ask you just to introduce yourself, your, your name, and if, if you're with a company or not, that would be great. Um, my co-pilot uh, with me on the panel is Matt, so I'll go first of all to Matt to ask Matt to introduce yep. himself. Hi everybody, welcome, thanks very much for coming. My name is Matt Barker, I am co-founder and now president of Jetstack. So I've spent my entire career in open source software companies. I was a very early employee of Canonical where I met um, Amanda. Uh, who was, uh, I was a sales guy, a young graduate sales guy, uh, kind of um, hassling Amanda to get all my contracts in so I could get my, my commission paid. And I, I just got really close to the engineers, uh, really fascinated by the technology, um, really interested when someone at Canonical was working on some technology which, which was called LXC, which became Docker. So I joined MongoDB, early, early employee in sales at MongoDB. And then when Kubernetes was open source, created a service company around uh, Kubernetes called Jetstack. Which did, which did services to bootstrap, hopefully, some open source projects that we could ultimately productize. And we, we had a, a really successful open source project called Cert Manager, which, we, um, which became a, a, a key part of the security of, uh, of Kubernetes. We were acquired a few years ago, so I've, uh, I've been through uh, a lot of the, the sort of pains of, of the topics that we're discussing. And uh, I'm really looking forward to exploring this with some really esteemed uh, panel guests. Uh, so that's me. Obviously, I'm entrepreneur in residence at, at Open UK. Really uh, passionate about helping people start businesses in and around open source. It's brought me so many benefits. I've had such a great time doing it. And um, yeah, I'm here to mentor, help. Um, and we do a lot of education sessions. And so that's what I'm here to do. Thank you very much, Matt. And if we just work our way along, Peter, hi, how are you? Sure. Well, uh, my name is uh, Peter Zaitsev. I'm a uh, founder and until I'm recently uh, CEO of uh, Pircona. So we uh, uh, specialize in helping people to run uh, open source uh, databases uh, best, uh, specifically focus on MySQL and Postgres as well as uh, source available uh, MongoDB. Uh, I think the interesting things about uh, Pircona is A, we are uh, a bootstrap company, which mm -hmm. is I think uh, relatively uncommon those days in uh, the database space. We did not you know, raise uh, any external funding in what uh, has been now more than 16 years uh, in, uh, in operation. And also, uh, all the software we ship is, uh, is open source, right? We don't have source available or, uh, uh, or open core. Well, besides kind of more good we derived stuff and we just uh, have to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, Amandine. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amandine Lepap. I'm a co-founder and a guardian of Matrix. Matrix is a decentralized, secure, um, open standard for uh, communication. Um, we created Matrix basically to break the silos and bring interoperability to communication, uh, which we've been missing for a while. 
Uh, I am also COO and co-founder of a company called Element, which builds on top of Matrix. We develop the flagship app called Element, imaginatively. And uh, we also sell services. <coughs> and uh, we do have some proprietary products as well around, uh, around Matrix. So uh, yeah, we have both entities separately. Great, thank you. And Guy? I'm Guy Pujarni, or Guypo. I'm the uh, founder of Sneak, uh, which is a developer security platform that isn't actually open source. It's a, sort of a, I like to say it's open source affiliated. You know, sort of it's, it, it plays a big role in the open source community, helping secure the open source community, helping you know, kind of establish secure practices amidst open source uh, consumers and open source maintainers alike. Uh, so it's very open source friendly, but it's not itself kind of an open source company. Uh, except for some clients and such that still need the service to operate. Uh, I'm also an angel investor uh, in a variety of early stage startups, including many of them that are sort of open core and a variety of open source uh, elements. So I've got a slightly different perspective from that lens as well about thinking through monetization, thinking through uh, um, uh, what's what, you know, sometimes initial, like should it be open source or not, but even sort of further paths, which I think is what we're talking about here. Um, how do you delineate? Uh, and mostly, mostly in product company, has actually have less mm -hmm. services uh, experience, and most of my experience is in, in open core product focused companies. Okay, Guy, thank you very much. So you've got a great panel. I'll hand over to Matt first of all to thank get you. us going. And I think actually be a good place to start, uh, Guy. I think is putting myself in the shoes of a, of, a, of a potential founder who might be exploring various different ways of getting their product to market. If someone's considering an open source product, um, what's the difference between selling around an open source project or product compared to maybe building and running a proprietary one? Um, I, I think, um, so, so maybe I'll start with a misconception. So I think people uh, confuse open source with some automagic distribution. They think like, we'll make it open source and therefore more people will adopt it. Um, and um, and that's not the case, you know, it's like, it depends on the product, it depends on the context. Uh, but I think, I think the, the, the difference, so in that sense, when you think about an open source project, what is the same as non-open source project is to think about distribution, to think about how people would find your products, to think about, you know, what would be easy, you know, low friction, what would be hard about adopting the product, and what are the capabilities that it builds. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, sort of subsequently what use cases it would provide. Um, I think, I think the, the sort of the healthy way to think about open source and where it's different is that it's an extreme version of freemium. And I say extreme because it's irreversible. If you're, if you're launching a, a freemium part of your service, then you are, you're able to tweak it, you're able to take something away, you're able to sort of evolve it over time. Um, and you, you always have to kind of work through the delineation between that and another. While when it's open source, it's a, it's a, it needs to be sort of a deeper, more sort of thought through decision around it. But at the end of the day, the dynamics that you're faced with are similar to a freemium service. You need to think about, you know, how do you get this to, to, more, to more users? And what, what, is, what, are, what, is, um, what are the use cases that the free tier, the open source tier, supports? And how do you make sure that those use cases are, are very well supported, that you're amazing at it. Uh, and uh, and you know, as, you, as you kind of propagate this through the world, and which use cases is the open source project not meant to support, uh, not meant yeah. to, uh, 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 to provide. With open source, you can't entirely control that it would never do that. Mm -hmm. you know, it could be that the community kind of evolves and broadens around it, but what is your intent? and that you sort of aim to support with a, with a commercial service around. So I think that's really the, the core of it, is to think of it as, as freemium, and to think about, like any freemium, you know, if you open up open source, then there's, there's things that open source is, um, uh, avenues that open source um, uh, opens up. Uh, you know, there, there are many of them, and I don't want to sort of hog too much time here, but the, you know, like one, one key example of it is, is for instance, in, in modern infrastructure today, and in database and all that, where there's expectations, or the example of, uh, Jetstack and, and sort of being able to to become part of the Kubernetes stack, so become part of an open source ecosystem. So those are opportunities that is open source. You, you, need to confirm. Uh, you mentioned the word freemium. Just for people who might not be fully aware of what that means, would someone mind just def defining it? Um, sure. I mean, I, basically, to me, freemium is is a uh, is a free a free uh, uh, aspect of your products. But unlike 
uh, people talk about product-led growth. Under that product-led growth, you know, there's really two lenses to it. There's freemium and free trial. Free trial is just the different sales technique. It's someone sort of signing up, you know, buying the product without it. Freemium is the intent that some subset of the users, hopefully a large one, would be using your product for free in perpetuity or in sort of a very extended period of time uh, without being expected to pay and be successful at whatever it is that they do. So that's, a, that's freemium because there's a free tier and there's some logic about upgrading that into premium. Some of what you were saying in, uh, your, in, 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 what, in, in that discussion we were just having was around the fact that you need to think in advance as to which part is going to be maybe paid for and which part's going to be free or, or open. If someone doesn't have any experience in actually managing or, or starting an open source business, how, how can they, what, what advice would you give to them about, about thinking when, where that Dylan issue might actually occur? Uh, because, you know, from, from my experience speaking to a lot of um, uh, founders of open source businesses, in some cases they don't always uh, even expect to start a company or a business around it. They're just scratching an itch <laughs> with a particular problem that they found on GitHub and they start an open source project. And by, and by the time they've kind of got a bit of traction, it's then hard to know where to take it from a commercial standpoint. Whereas I think some of what you're saying, guys, is think about that in advance. For people who maybe just started an open source project, they don't know whether it's going to become a company or not. What can they be thinking about now uh, when it comes to commercializing it later down the line? Have you got any good pieces of advice? Uh, from our point of view, you need to think about the value. So it's a balance between what can you bring and make available for free, which is going to grow the project, bring more users, bring more visibility, whilst keeping the, some of the, the value that you're going to bring as the income stream for your company. Uh, one thing in terms of open source versus proprietary bits of your product uh, if you are putting too much things into the proprietary then, and it's too useful, then the community will just probably come up with it by themselves. So um, you may lose here because you won't be able to even um, monetize the feature or the, the product that you just developed because it will come up by the community. So it's really, that's the thought process that we use on a day-to-day -day basis is like, okay, this functionality how useful is it? If I don't make it free, uh, is it easy for people to implement it by themselves? And that really helps in terms of balance. Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, there is this, uh, in a database space where we operate, often it's uh, very good to look uh, at the difference between your uh, users uh, and uh, buyers, which may not be the same, uh, same person, right? And that means, in uh, many cases, you want to uh, developers be, uh, having frictionless adoption and uh, getting a value from your software. But then, when it comes to some uh, enterprise uh, needs, right, which developers may not care as much about, right, that is where commercial uh, mm -hmm. solutions often in place, right. I think that's very common in the industry, right. And if you look at uh, at that, both let's say MySQL enterprise, right, or MongoDB mm -hmm. enterprise, it would be things like you know auditing, mm -hmm. right, or pluggable authentication, or, or things like that, which uh, uh, is uh, typically proprietary with uh, uh, large organizations. Uh, but there's something else I think which is uh, important for Percon in particular. Uh, what uh, we found is what even if your uh, software is uh, open source many of the same enterprise buyers, they just do not want to do it alone, right, for, for other reasons. Because that idea in saying, hey, you know what, I'll just use the software, and if it doesn't work, well, I will hope that there's a community around that which will help me. Well, you know, that may not be compatible with your job security. And remember, people in the enterprise companies are not spending their own money. Right, we are spending enterprise money, right? And in this case, they may care about minimizing their personal risk, right? And maximizing their opportunities more than actually spending the company money. I would just sort of emphasize, you know, and I think aligns with both of those, that to me, and I'm oftentimes a broken record talking about use cases, it's mm -hmm. about saying which use cases are supported by the open source piece and which use cases are supported by the premium piece. And it's okay, sometimes use cases, I, I, I agree, you know, uh, translate to value a lot of times. It's like, okay, what type of value are you providing me? You know, what type of need? 
uh, and you know they're different for a buyer and a user or for a large organization. For Snake, the you know the the, the freemium, not open source, but I think it's the same concept here. The freemium tier is designed for you know developers. If you're a developer and you're writing code and you want that code to be secure, you should be able to use the product for free. It's a part of that, and the product needs to be very good at it. I think the the mistake, the sort of the the thing that people do is they fear giving too much value away in the open source piece, and because of that, they cripple it. And by purpose of that, they make the open source experience not awesome. They make the things in the free tier not good at doing that. And so while you, once you define, so it's like these things, they're meant to be free, and we're going to invest in making sure that they are you know, mm -hmm. really, really good on the user as a free tier. And there's a bunch of these other things, oftentimes enterprise scalability needs by the way, oftentimes surround sound, oftentimes things that might not be the core exciting thing of it, but rather about making it usable at a large scale, complicated environment. Um, but you, you just need to define those use cases, they're gonna be premium. And yeah, sometimes the open source kind of, the community itself encroaches on you a little bit on it and, and evolves it and you have to adapt to it and that's a part of the open source kind of game. Uh, but it really boils down to just understanding the use cases, and I think that's true whether you've started, like if you mm -hmm. if you if you already have a thriving uh, or a you know nascent sort of open source project that you want to turn into commercialized, you still have to go through the same exercise. You may be more limited because there's a thing that's already out there, so you have to kind of crisp you know crystallize what are the use cases you want to keep supporting with that, and you have to convince yourself that there's use cases that allow commercial because not every open source project has commerciality, kind of, you know, has mm -hmm. commercial potential, uh, and that's okay. Um, and so it really boils down to just sort of defining uh, those. Great. One of the things that, I, that, that, that was tricky in my mind. Sorry, we have a question. Oh, great. Well, Hello. Oh, there just, we just wanted to ask a question. There seems to be an hidden assumption in this conversation that open source commercialization is open core. As in, like, there's some part that's going to be open source, and that is, you know, is a lead generation for the premium part. And I think Guy was uh, hinting in that direction. Is that the only model that you see working? Yeah, I think open core is not super well defined. I think if you're talking about a product company, then you're building a product, and if you want not all of the value to be open, uh, uh, because you want some product capabilities to be the things that you're monetizing then yes, I think it basically naturally gets you into some form of open core, like of the 100% technology that you're building, 100% product that you're building, some percentage of that is open source, and some percentage is kept differently. There is a totally different, and I think kind of you know, proven on this panel as well, business model that is more services and enablement, uh, that is, uh, it's, uh, somebody someone, you know, called it like the order from chaos, uh, <laughs> that like Kubernetes or, or Linux, you know, they're sort of such complicated beasts that it's much more about the kind of uh, manageability and the administration. So, so there could be an open core version of it and there could be a services business. But yeah, I think if it's, if it's product based, if it's a product solution uh, that is open source based, it's hard for me to imagine something that isn't in some form open core uh, with pieces of software that gets created that are not open sourced. Uh, or at least not licensed, like again, not maybe they can be source available for transparency for a variety of reasons, but not open source. Yeah, many companies are just uh, on services, that's what you were saying as well on your side, no? Well, uh, uh, not quite, but uh, okay. why don't you answer and then I'll <laughs> provide my, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> my point. No, I was just, uh, because we had Nextcloud earlier uh, on the panel, right, and yeah. he was yeah. uh, basically Nextcloud is uh, just uh, entirely open source, so it's just pure services. So you really have both models uh, around and sometimes a mix, like we do, we have a mix of it. Yeah, well, uh, what I think uh, uh, in this case, first, uh, I would say like of all, open core is one of solutions, right? In our space, if you look at this kind of commercialization, the SaaS is another approach, right? A lot of uh, companies, especially in the database space, they are focusing on that, right? And, and often that also p uh, pushes them to have uh, sources of uh, source available licenses rather than uh, uh, than open source to prevent the cloud competition. But that's, uh, I think, one uh, the important uh, model, right? Now, I also think that there is some a little bit kind of a uh, misunderstanding of a service and product uh, as a uh, black and white, right? If you look at, uh, at Percona, right, what our position is with a product, our uh, customers are running Percona software. That is why they come to us. 
you know, yes, we did used to do some stuff, but our software is, is, uh, is open source, but at the same time, they surprised to that the same thing as they surprised the enterprise version of our competition. You know, MySQL Enterprise, you know, whatever, offering by Enterprise DB, MariaDB Enterprise, and so on and so forth, right? And, uh, and as I mentioned, the fact what the software for open source, that does not mean you can't charge the same way as a per instance, right? Like, let's say per instance or some other stuff, right? It doesn't have to be, oh, I sell you hours. And if you look at, let's say, some financial metrics, right, like, you know, uh, retention uh, rate, uh, right, or the, uh, the margin, uh, in this case, we are, uh, you know, getting uh, very close, right, or <laughs> getting a similar number to what the open core va uh, values are, right? I think investors don't like it, right, because uh, uh, investors, they like this kind of force, right? And what if your customers don't love you anymore? We want to make sure we have no freaking way to ditch you, right? That is, I think, what uh, a lot of uh, investor percentages is, right? But I think if you are really doing good by your customers, you can lock your customers in with love and nothing but love. I think like uh, the point on site, sort of an, an interesting view. I'm more cynical than that. Like in terms of the uh, the sort of the, the love element, I do think there, there's service. There's elements of like overall cost of ownership, and I think the SaaS point is a very very good one. Uh, so I just sort of want to clarify. Like I think SaaS is not only a good, but maybe even like the best on average uh, kind of business model for a lot of open source software. You know, but I perceive it as as open core in a way. So like for me, the sort of the description of SaaS includes that because there's actually a fair bit of software that you need to build to be able mm -hmm. to operate it. But it does come down, but, but, but conceptually it's different enough that I think it's a very good point that it, it's separate. You can help them operate the, uh, the open source uh, solution in a successful fashion, and you can do that by hosting it for them, which is a form, it's somewhere between service and open score. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in that sort of continuous. Just a quick question, uh, just to clarify, by SaaS you mean like the web kind of layer on top, or what, what, did, what did you mean by SaaS? Well, I mean, it, it can, uh, what I mean by SaaS, right? That can be a variety, right, of solution. If you look at a database space, uh, well, yes, that typically comes with some, you know, SaaS uh, GUI management. But again, often the open core solutions, right? Like if you think about, uh, like, well, uh, MongoDB space, there's a MongoDB Atlas, which has everything, but then there's also, like, uh, MongoDB Ops Manager, which allows you to have some GUI uh, on-prem, right? But, uh, but I think it, the SaaS also is usable for many other products which are uh, the, the not uh, on this level, like WordPress, I think is a fantastic example of an open SaaS, uh, uh, SaaS company, right? There are some proprietary things in the, in the WordPress offering, but I use them as example of how you can do it and do it well by your customer. Because if you think about WordPress, you can self hoard WordPress and get uh, fantastic results, right? You can host them on uh, automatics like WordPress.com, or frankly, there is uh, probably hundreds of other independent hosters which also you can host WordPress with, right? Automatic did not come and say, no, 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 we are so afraid of all those kind of other people which are going to compete, right? So we will relicense WordPress and some productive license. They didn't do it, right? And again, in their case, in their special circumstances, they have been proven to be very successful. So, uh, there's, um, moving on to a slightly different topic, there's a preconceived idea maybe by people who are getting into starting an open source business or creating an open source company that, that you'll be able to make sales easily because there's lots of a big community of users and they will automatically turn to customers. I mean, for people who were on the panel earlier, I think Frank was saying from Nextcloud that he's never had a salesperson. All of his, all of his sales have been, have been inbound because the, the strength of the adoption of the open source community has meant that he's been able to kind of easily sell a, a product or service on top of that. Do the, have the panelists seen, seen the same thing? Is there, is there a need for for a salesperson in an open source company, or can you just rely on the strength of the, the adoption from the community? From our side, <coughs> uh, we, from our side we, definitely, uh, we definitely have seen some inbound coming from the community. And same thing, like we do have a sales uh, team, but it took us three years before hiring the first person. And it's 
whilst um, basically what you don't want to do is look at your community as a, a, a group of leads that you are going to turn into customers because that's the best way to make them run a while, uh, it's definitely somewhere where you get more visibility. It's it's some marketing at some level. You get the credibility from the techies, and then they take this credibility and bring it in-house into the enterprise, their government, and pitch you to their uh, organizations. So from our perspective, it's definitely one of the channels mm -hmm. uh, to bring customers on board. Guy, say the same thing? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um so first of all, I'd say it's, it's the same as in any freemium, you know, so you have to, you know, you have a free tier and the question is how do people convert to it? At the, at the very minimum, you would need to build, uh, you'd need to either have a salesperson that takes the inbound call mm -hmm. and they're still selling happening at that point, or you'd need to build like a self-serve kind of a commercialization, like, you know, a website and all that. So you're going to need to build something to allow people to purchase uh, or engage with them. Um, I think um, it, it depends on, on the use cases and the sort of the smoothness of the transition to them and specifically the who needs to be involved. So if, you're, uh, if it's a, a database product and at a certain volume of it, you've had to, regardless of whether that's wise or not, right? You know, you've had to kind of go to the commercial tier, then I think it's very natural for you to, to just sort of self-purchase. So anything that is volume-based but it's the same individual I think that lends itself to it. If I contrast with Sneak, you know, in Sneak, oftentimes the developer is the most important user and the sort of the primary user in the free tier, mm -hmm. but oftentimes the person signing the check is the security person. And in, in that case, there's been more need. Like, we do have uh, a lot mm -hmm. of that engagement, but I want to separate between, uh, like, the inbound versus the outbound. In, in Sneak's case, the majority of our, our deals, definitely in dollar volume, are, are done with, with sales uh, activity. And the vast, vast majority, I think some 70% of the deals, have had an active, successful free user in the account beforehand. So the, the, in my seed deck, I have like salesperson, like sales team scratched out, uh, uh, you know, sort of a self-serve revenue. Uh, and I consider that to be one of my naivete kind of uh, moments in it. Right. Like it's absolutely not the case, as would you know, attest to the hundreds of salespeople that we have in the company. <laughs> but, uh, but they are... Um, it, it's, it's not disconnected. So the freemium tier and open source is very much an example of that. They, convey, they, 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 they advertise your existence in the, in the scene. They demonstrate your sort of, they, they, they build your brand. They give confidence your product would actually mm -hmm. work and do what is, what is needed. And so the sales process in, a, in an open source, in a successful kind of open source community context is entirely different. Um, and so I would say for us, Open, like the, the free tier is a massive driver of our sales efficiency. It drives a lot of leads, but it absolutely also helps deals close faster right. uh, because of the existing kind of confidence and mileage that people have in it uh, in the company. Basically, you have a clear champion in the, in the customer. Well, and what I would uh, say, it uh, depends uh, on the product, on the, on the customer a lot, right? I think we're having a lot of... Uh, uh, Projects very successful with a self-service uh, model, right? Especially uh, relatively small deal sizes, right? Uh, uh, to, to many, uh, mm -hmm. many companies. Again, not just in open source, right? But in uh, in uh, other models uh, as well, uh, where we find uh, uh, salespeople are needed is just a large uh, enterprise deals, right? If you look at uh, multi-year, multi-million dollar uh, deal, right? Then company is building strategic uh, relationship with you, right, then uh, that is often when uh, sales are needed, there's a lot of communication happens, right, there's like a compliance team, security team, whatever, you need uh, somebody to chaperone that, and they actually are uh, expecting that, right, they're expecting things to be, you know, somewhat custom. Uh, uh, in this case. And this comes, uh, it's a, it, I f totally agree, and it, it, there's two aspects to it. There's one is the sort of the, the making, getting the deal done, you know, all these different stakeholders that need to be managed and sort of satisfied to be able to get the deal done. But also there's the actually making them successful with the product because mm -hmm. you need to keep hand-holding and controlling to kind of help, especially when there's some form of transformation required yeah. uh, in the product. And, and many of these large enterprise deals requires it. I mean, for us, the engagement with enterprise customers is, a lot of it is, is around that. It's like, you know, the, it needs the sort of the, the touch, you know, and the support. 
uh, above and beyond whatever sort of self-serve mm -hmm. nature of the product to make them successful. And a good example of that, by the way, is Slack. You know, Slack has, has built up a great business coming free, you know, yeah. a, a product-led you know, tier yeah. built like that, you know, like super, super successful. And they intentionally, despite all the instrumentation in their systems that allow self-serve large purchases, they intentionally engage large enterprises with the sales and they require them to yeah. buy through a sales because otherwise, if they don't have that, they don't successfully adopt the product. Yeah. They don't successfully adapt. Very specific question, but do you actually incentivize your customer success managers at, at Sneak with commissions and so on, or do you separate that from... So do you, do you think of customer success as a sales mechanism or more literally? It's always a combo of sort of service and, uh, of, of, of service and, uh, and revenue. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, the two should align. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I, I, it basically, to me, and from all I've seen around, it's never right for it to be zero on either one of those sides. And the exact percentages, it depends a little bit on your product and what you're currently trying right. to incentivize. So we've changed it over time as well, mm -hmm. you know, depending on what the immediate need was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Could, could I um, come yeah. in here? I think this is a really interesting discussion, given everything else that we've spoken about. So yeah. we, we, the session we had before this was all about community and about being inclusive. And now we're talking about revenue and sales. And all the work that I do, sales is the one area that my founders hate to talk about, particularly my early stage ones, because you're moving from that inclusive, engaged community, how, you know, and, and people working with you on your project and helping you develop from project to product to service. And somewhere along the line, you've got to make money because, you know, it's just a, a fact of life. So given the fact we've got in, in our audience um, some colleagues who are at that very early stage, what's it like, what's your advice moving from engaging the community, harnessing that passion, keeping them engaged, and then having to sell? Because those are different skill sets. Advice? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you how I can tell you how I did it. Um, I, I look for friends. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm lucky in the fact that I had a sales background. So I was, I was, I mean, I spent yeah. my entire career in software sales. So I, I at least knew. I think if I didn't know anything about sales, I'd be, I'd be, uh, I, I would have been in a very different position. But what I decided to do, and this is even me um, knowing a lot about sales, was not go to a direct company and try to sell to them or try and knock down the door of some enterprise to tell them about Kubernetes. I went to where Kubernetes was created, which was Google. And I actually educated <laughs> the Google people. I actually got told early days, uh, don't start a company around Kubernetes, you know, start it around data services. Kubernetes is probably not going to go anywhere. Um, so we went in and actually did a, um, we actually did a series of education sessions for the pre-sales engineers and the sales people mm. at Google and effectively positioned ourselves as, as, as people that knew a lot about it. And we were opening their, their eyes to, a, to, a, to a, an open source project that they were about to turn into a service. And what we found was that just by building those relationships, we ended up almost becoming an extension to the Google sales and, and yeah. pre-sales yeah. team. So every time a customer heard of uh, heard Kubernetes, then, uh, then they'd, they'd, they'd contact us. We then supplemented that with, um, with training. So education and training was a great way of us helping to actually seed the market and, and get people talking to us and engaging about the ways that they wanted to use the technology. And actually, all of our early customers came either via training courses that we ran or a partnership with, uh, with, with, with Google um, or some of the other partners that were, that were kind of... We, well, no one was actually buying services from us originally because no one was actually using Kubernetes. We actually ended up making relationships with vendors who are interested in the concept of Kubernetes against other orchestrators and then paying us to do connectors for Kubernetes for their product, which then enabled us to get into conversations with their customers. So, so, so I'd say a good tip for potential founders is maybe don't... Make, make, try and make it easy for yourself and maybe go and find people that you can create relationships with that actually will help you to get into the door uh, of, of these customers. Uh, otherwise, just doing it yourself and trying to get directly into an enterprise, it's going to be quite tricky without a big team of pre-sales engineers, yeah. a big marketing budget, um, you know, a, a pre-existing brand or market. You can't, you know, you're not, you're not represent when you're a startup, no one knows your name, your brand, you know, it's very, it's very tricky. So I'd say leverage third parties and that was, that was, a, big, that was a big help for us. Yeah. I mean, uh, my experience was like uh, slightly different, right? Because I am uh, was an engineer before uh, uh, before starting company, right? And uh, frankly, I had this kind of a 
uh, like uh, attitude towards salespeople, right? We as in Jimmy, yeah. uh, had like an uh, attitude towards the salespeople, <laughs> yeah. like say, well, look at that, those salespeople, they do nothing. They just hang out with people, <laughs> go to expensive restaurant, and they seem to be paid shitload of money, money compared to us engineer who actually write all the code, right? <laughs> And then uh, many years later, I understand, oh my gosh, they have this, you know, like an absolutely miserable job. <laughs> I would hate to be doing myself, you know, absolutely mm, I hate it, right? And yes, I understand why they're, uh, they're paid so much, right? And I think this kind of wonderful thing, like one of my executives says, hey, you know what? What is the interesting thing between uh, your salesperson, your engineer, right? Because a lot of open source engineer, if you don't pay them, right? Well, they're still going to go ahead and write code, right? Maybe different code, right? But that is sort of like their all the life, right? Like engineers, scientists, that is what we do. Guess about uh, salesperson. If you don't pay them, it's not like they're going to, you know, go uh, and uh, sell, sell the stuff, right? That is something which is kind of like a hard job which is done to make a, uh, make a good living, right? Yeah. Well, but this, uh, but anyway, like for me, I think the conversion started because I, as a, mm, uh, as a founder, had to uh, learn to sell. And I think that is a very wonderful thing for founders, mm -hmm. not just to say, hey, let's outsource that on a day one, right? Because uh, selling really helped you to understand what messages to align and how people really value in your product. Because, Gifted engineers especially, like they uh, live in a kind of different world, right? Often they don't naturally understand how real humans think, right? They are geniuses, like one of, you know, portion of a 1%, right, in this case. And, and that kind of selling experience really understands you, like who are your really customers? Mm -hmm. Who really cares mm -hmm. uh, uh, what they care about? And I would encourage everybody to do that even if it sucks and you will hate it, right, before actually hiring someone. Um, and Peter, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, I, I've worked with so many early stage ventures. They've managed to secure phenomenal amounts of backing based on, their, their, as we discussed yes, you know, yesterday, the, their vision, their proposition, maybe traction, but often not even traction. And then I say to them, what are you going to do now? And one of the first things they say to me is, I'm going to hire a marketing director. I'm going to hire a sales director. Why are you going to do that? Because I don't really want to sell and I don't want to speak to customers. And I always advise them, please go and mm -hmm. speak yeah. to customers. Because only when you speak to customers are you then able to engage in the conversations that, that they want to hear about, that will help them understand the benefits you know, how you're going to either drive efficiencies for them or just make life easier for them in, in whatever capacity yeah. that might actually be. But without having those conversations, you do, it's difficult to even know what language to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would also add something I think is also important here. As a founder, you will always have some selling superpowers no salesperson will ever be able to match. Yeah, that's true, because you, you really know your product. Yeah. Yeah. And you understand it. Yeah. So, like For me, I, I very much separate between selling and deal-making. And I think the two are, are quite distinct. I actually really quite like selling. Like Selling, to me, is around distilling the value that I've created to the pain that a customer has. Yeah. I think it's incredibly powerful. And I think if you don't do it, then you don't understand your product. And you're very much likely not to build the right product. Like you're, You have to connect it to customer pain. And then once you've connected to the customer pain, if you can't articulate it, you, know, you need to yeah. do that. That's an important investment for you to mm -hmm. do it. And when you get it right, you build better products. And, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's a joy because you get to like go and talk to a person and tell them yeah. how you're going to help them not feel a pain. You know? yeah. So I actually really like selling. I, nice like, yeah. I like getting people to kind of fall in love with the product that I am kind mm -hmm. of offering them and how it would help their life. Yeah. I hate deal making. Yeah. Like I hate <laughs> negotiating on yeah. how many dollars has that precisely done that. Uh, and I, I think, you know, one answer to that is indeed, like, bring a salesperson, decouple yourself. There's also, like, some value that you're coming with a salesperson and you remain kind of a little bit pure, like, you remain a little bit, like... Uh, the slimy sales guy, yeah, you can well, deal with but, that. But yeah. it's, like, it's useful in the customer relationship, yeah. right? Because you're, like, someone else does the dirty yeah. work, which yeah. is part of the, yeah. the reason it might be a miserable yeah. job. Maintain the so it's actually, like, a salesperson role, yeah. versus yeah. a sales leader. It's building yeah. that out. I'd also remind 
uh, founders that uh, uh, everything is a product and your sales process is a product and your V1 is going to yeah. suck. And yeah. so, you know, getting a salesperson, iterating, building that is important. Uh, so, like, I do think it's useful to, to bring a salesperson mm -hmm. alongside you fairly easy. The only thing I kind of have to alleviate the pain of deal making is to sort of remind them a little bit that uh, it's in their benefit, that it's in their best interest, that your company will stay alive uh, for a longer period of time. And so, uh, you know, for me, and I come back a little bit to use cases, if you kind of, if you're comfortable with the division between what's free and what's paid, and you're explaining that these paid things are amazing, you've sold that, they want the paid thing, you don't need to terribly apologize, you know, to, to the fact you're charging money for it. It's like, look, I, I, I've literally said this to sort of customers, it's like, look, you know, it's just not practical, it's not pragmatic for us to, you know, charge you less than, you know, 100 grand and sort of still give you a customer legal agreement and sort of unlimited liability towards it. And I think it's in your best interest that we stay a vi viable business unless you want to mm -hmm. sort of swap this every year, you know, some other thing. And so there's some constraints we have to work with. So, you know, generally, if we align on value, we should be able to align on price. Um, and then I hand it off to the salesperson <laughs> because I really don't like like that uh, that deal. But but it's uh, you know you have to do some of that dirty work. But the deal making piece I would hire for where I can. Okay, Amadine, yeah. you had something to say. Uh, yeah, but basically I completely agree. Founder sales is yeah you cannot you cannot build a company without being the first salesperson. I don't think it's uh, it's possible. Uh, in terms of handing over to a sales team, where we had issues, it's been really how do you manage to take these enthusiasm, understanding of the product and put it into someone else's mind because they will come at it with a very external approach and yes, you have the benefits and I'm going to pitch the benefits, but there is always a gap between the two and honestly, we're still, like, so three, three years later, we're still trying to say, how do we actually onboard this sales team to get as passionate and mm -hmm. understanding of the thing? Another thing which I'm not sure if it's specific to us, but same like neither me or my co-founder are um, salespeople, uh, and we always approach it with a very technical selling. Like this is what the technical problem we're solving, and had a hard time taking it from. There is some value that you can express, but it means that our sales our sales team are very technical as well, and I don't know if that's because we've found it easiest in terms of transition. Or if it's just that our product, it's technical. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Some, that's really great discussions. A few things that I've, I've been thinking as you've been talking. Um, I, I, I knew I wanted to become a founder even from when I was maybe 14, 15. So I, I read every book I could possibly read on starting a business. First chapter in most of them was you have to be good at sales. So I decided that I was going to go and get a sales job. And I went into door-to-door -door sales, genuinely, for three summers at university to pay my way through university. There was no better grounding. I still use that experience every single day. So if you're a founder, potential founder, that knows you want to start a company, but doesn't know what it's going to be in yet, then I would honestly recommend getting a sales job. It would be a great foundation yeah. for what you, want to do, what you want to do in the future, genuinely. And the second thing I would say is if you go into, technical, if you go into a software sales in a technical organization, my next piece of advice would be spend a lot of time with the engineers because you're going to be much better at understanding how the value of the product ends up connecting with the... Uh, Sorry, uh, the, the features of the product connect with the value to the customer. And I think a lot of, um, you know, to, to your point earlier, early in my career, salespeople were literally siloed from the engineers. And it was like, a, it was almost like a, there was a barrier between the two. And salespeople didn't like the engineers, engineers didn't like the salespeople. And I think, you know, I, I like to think of someone as myself, as someone who spent mo most of my time actually with the engineers, understanding the challenges they were trying to overcome. And that helped me tremendously like, through, throughout my career. So I'd say, those, those were just two things that I picked out or was thinking about when you were, when you were discussing. And, and you build better product. I, mean, I, was a, I was an SE for about four months. Right. <laughs> I was an engineer and I wanted to become a product manager. There was no product manager job available. There was an opportunity to be this sort of meta SE and I was kind of deep in the product. Uh, and I did it, and it was really educational. Two fronts. One, I realized I don't want to do that for a job. Uh, and two, it was like it really like being in that sort of pain point of sort of giving a demo to a customer and seeing, and the buttons don't work, and the sort of the thing yeah. doing it, or it's like you know the customer doesn't get it. Like that type of experience is what eventually makes you make a better product. Definitely. You know, there's no doubt. And actually, when you are a founder, try, uh, make sure that you continue to stay in at the coal face with your customers. Yeah. I think I've seen a lot of uh, founders that get to the point where they don't end up speaking to customers after a while because the company gets so big 
uh, and they're just focusing on they're managing the people who manage the people who <laughs> deliver the service or deliver the product, and you, you, you can become removed. So I'd say it's really important, even if you succeed and you get large, that you should continue to, to have those conversations. I, I agree. A lot of the work that I do is helping companies scale up. And when I started doing this, I was... I I'd made some suggestions about you know having a deep dive back into their company to remind themselves of their purpose and why they were doing what they were doing, and um, we, we the way we ran it we'd meet every six weeks, and each six weeks their companies would get smaller in some way, and I'd be thinking oh I'm really worried because the idea is that we're growing. They they had lost touch with what was going on in their business and so when they started doing reacquainting themselves many of them they, they got rid of their sales director because they realized that actually they were not delivering on the, the, the product was great okay the customers were great but they were not closing the deals yep. um can anyone guess the second <laughs> um key appointment that some of them got rid of that's highly relevant to this topic. Director of Finance. Director of Sales and Director of Finance, two most common ones to go. And that's because they are such influential positions within your organisation that delegating completely to those positions and working on your business all the time rather than some of the time in the business is a really dangerous thing to do. So, so we talk about ambidextrous leadership, so that you, you, you know those times when you need to work in the business and the other times when you need to work on the business, but you always need to be able to read a set of financial accounts and not delegate that to someone else. Can I, can I, can I refine that a little bit, just from like an experience yeah. when you reach sort of larger scales, right? And we're sort of, you know, well into sort of the nine figures of yeah. sort of, uh, of, of sales and we're growing. And I brought, uh, uh, I replaced myself a CEO about three and a bit years ago with, with Peter, who's amazing and a far better CEO than I was. And, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me was to sort of look at Peter as CEO versus me and, you know, how do we do things differently? Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. And one of the observations I have, which he kind of, sort of, not entirely agrees with, uh, is that when someone comes to me with a decision, I scrutinize the decision. I try to sort of understand the different aspects of, like, you know, why did you decide this? And I, I kind of try to agree with the decision myself. And generally, Peter, when he, someone comes to him with a decision, he scrutinizes the decision process. He scrutinizes, like, what came into this? How did you make this decision? Which I think is a much more scalable approach mm -hmm. uh, and allows you to sort of do so. I think sometimes when you're sort of a technical founder, this is like, what do I know about finance? Mm -hmm. What do I know about sales? Above and beyond the absolute truism that I think we all agree, which is that like you have to stay close to customers. You have to sort of stay close to, to the sort of the value that you're providing to them. Uh, is to think a little bit. It's like, if you don't feel comfortable, you can understand the topic. Try to scrutinize the decision process. Yeah. Try to scrutinize, like, were the right questions asked? Yeah. And it's actually super enlightening. Like, for me, once I started sort of, you know, in investing more time in that, it's, it's, it's just, you know, I think it's greatly improved my, my ability to sort yeah, of assess I, 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 uh, people. I think they'll have a question. Yeah. Question. Uh, yeah. Um, hi. Um, going back to the open core and freemium, um, I just, well, I'm new to open source. I want to get wrap my head around open core. Um, what I see the difference there being, especially looking at a product, is the open core would be your your premium side would be a function of your free side, uh, whereas the pre the premium your premium is not necessarily a function of the free side because you own both of them. So if you're for open core, if your um, free side just runs wild, how do you um, adapt and how do you sort out your money-making side? How do you de-risk that? Does that make sense? So your, your open source part can be led by community and can go in a different direction to what the company was anticipating uh, as a product. Um, so your open, your, well, premium product would not necessarily would make sense maybe. Does, does that make sense or not? I think maybe, maybe the question is maybe the conflict of interest there between the, uh, your open source project that's focused at the community and your paid for products. Yeah, or, not or necessarily conflict. I would say just um, 
a different evolution. So if, if the open source just evolves in a different direction that you're uh, anticipating for the revenue generating product, ah, I see. How, how do you so de-risk it? So responding to the, to, the, to the dynamics of, of the yeah. community and how that yeah. plays into product. So I yeah. think the thing uh, is, it's not because your product is open source that your community is leading it mm -hmm. and they have full control of it. We talked to, uh, again this morning, talked a bit about roadmap and basically, at least that's how we do, and I don't think we are the only ones, it's still the company has the control of the roadmap of the open source project, product. And then the community can contribute additional stuff on top of it, and that's very fine because it may be useful features. But if you, the company is still driving it forward, and then you can add potentially proprietary product around this open source product to actually monetize. And you try to get your open source version, and the open core were, um, expression is quite loaded because um, for quite some time, and I think it's probably still a bit the case, it can sound very negative. And going to a customer saying, I'm doing an open core model, like they may just like kick you out. Because of uh, what uh, we've seen is that sometimes the open source version is crippled. So it's like barely usable uh, at all. Uh, uh, without buying the proprietary stuff around it. So then that's where you need to find the balance of the open source needs to be usable and nice to grow the attraction, the usability of the product, you had, add more users, and then you sell the additional product around because it brings value to maybe a specific group of users. Maybe they need extra security because they're a government or they need compliance because they're financial services. And the open source community and other people may not care at all about compliance. They just need a communication system in our case. That, that's so help. from what I understand, um, the open source community doesn't necessarily directly contribute to the product. They do contribute, but they don't necessarily drive the roadmap. So they're not the ones saying, uh, like, they may bring a feature, but the company needs to know where they're taking their product, at least like for our kind of product. Like we decide what is going on our app, what do we do next, edit and reactions, or do we do threading? Uh, wh where are we going with this communication service? But and again, maybe the company wants to add voice messages to it, and yeah, that's fine, sure, why not? <coughs> well, so what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what I want to say, I think, is what is uh, uh, like, uh, we are talking about the open source, right? But the open source does not di dictate any particular form of governance, yeah. right? And I, th I would split like open source into two big buckets. There is a company-driven open source, and there is some you know, foundation or community-driven uh, open source, uh, uh, right, uh, in this case. There is a huge difference, right? But now, even in a corporate-driven open source, you may have things uh, differently, right? For example, uh, MongoDB, even before they adopted the uh, proprietary license, right, their CEO was saying, we did not open source MongoDB to that help. We open source that as a, you know, part of marketing strategy. Distribution. Right, oh, distribution yeah. strategy, right? Yes. I don't really, but on the other hand, it's kind of similar company, Elastic, right, uh, they were uh, depending a lot on open source contributors, right, and I think by the time they changed the model, it was like more than a thousand contributors uh, have been involved in that, right? So I think that is where things uh, can uh, change a lot. Yeah, and even, even the foundations, they would have a governance body that leads the project. The community, it's never a free-for-all. Someone's kind of leading, someone's charting it. All that said, I think there are examples of, of things that I think are mistakes in areas that you designate the community to grow. And so I've come across cases where they said, well, we'll, we'll build a system and the community can bring plugins on it and we will have these, uh, uh, for connecting to these enterprise systems, that would be our commercial offering. So as well, you can't have, like if your platform is meant for the community to, to, bring, to build extensions to it, and you're just going to hope that they don't build the extension that you actually want to build your business on, that's tricky. And so sometimes you can build a high quality premium extension mm -hmm. and actually monetize that and, and you know, basically feel confident that if the community builds, like there might be another extension the community builds that does it differently and it's free, and then you can do it. So I think at the end of the day, you just you have to make sure that there's depth to the premium alongside what is free. You know, like you can't you can't think that you'd sort of build something that is open source and 90% of the value is going to be there, and then you know you're going to build another 10% of value, but be able to capture the 100% value in, in the dollars you make. 
You know, that just doesn't work. So the open source piece fuels your business, you know, like if you were to do 50-50, hopefully you get 75% of the value, you know, back. But, but there has to be a depth to both the sort of the open source piece, otherwise it doesn't get used, doesn't, get, doesn't become successful, and there has to be a depth to the premium piece uh, of, of real additional value that you provide, you know, some related to the open source project and some mm -hmm. less so. Thank you. I just think yeah, Actually, maybe there's a confusion. Yeah, I have a question. I, I'm just supposed to be the volunteer, but this is a <laughs> fascinating conversation. Um, I just want to take you back to the uh, sales uh, founders getting involved in the sales versus making the deal. Um, my and just for a bit of context, I advise uh, companies, startup companies, on IP and technology licensing, not necessarily just open source, but. Um, my observation generally, depending on the type of founder, if they come from a technical background, if they're involved with the customers directly, there is overcommitment versus somebody like Matt from a sales background who sees value that I'm going to sell them other things in the future. How do you control that in, 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 a, in a small sm startup environment, that, that overcommitting as a founder um, your business uh, to specific customers? I, I, so so I've, I've grown like a little bit cynical about it. I, like for me, when I talk to a company that is building some sort of open source, uh, com, kind of compelling open source project, and when I, when I ask, why is this open source? Uh, I get entirely ideological kind of uh, answer to it, because open source is right, because this needs to be open, and all that. I don't invest. Uh, and it doesn't mean that open source projects shouldn't be there, but some open source projects belong in foundations, they belong in, in sort of those elements, and, and some teams, really should be building <laughs> their sort of products there because they have no, no drive, no desire, no kind of passion to doing it. And they're just building an open source uh, project and they're raising money because it's a way to fund their open source project, but they don't actually want to build a business around it. I think if you're raising money, then you should be uh, uh, motivated. You should expect that you're going to need to build a business around that open source project. And you should have some level of interest <laughs> and some level of perspective of how that might work. Uh, and if not, then you might be an amazing citizen of the open source community. But I don't know if it's right for you to sort of found a company. There are, of course, gray areas for people that do have the interest in sort of doing the business, but they don't really know where. That's fine. But if, it's like a, if, if the reason something is open source is purely out of a desire because everything should be open, um, I think you can be, it can be very tricky. I don't know if I'm sort of touching on your question, but. It's, some of that has to sort of come down to, uh, to, to interest, right? I was going to uh, talk a little bit about the fact, early, earlier in my, career, in my career, there was a concept of drive-by selling. I, I guess this is maybe what you're, you're touching on with the with the, yeah. with the, with the, with the That's question. That's right. Yeah, and um, salespeople would just, you know, probably maybe including me, I think, at the time, would go and sort of, um, you know, we'd have high, like commission rates would be massively pressurized. Um, we wouldn't have a connection to the engineering team, the support team. Uh, you know, we, we, we'd be probably slightly overrule the pre-sales engineer. And there were times when, uh, lots of times, I'd like to say I was not one of the worst offenders, but where uh, a contract got sold and the, the actual, it, it looked like a, a large amount of uh, money on paper, but when you actually got into the details, you realized that you're not going to make any margin on that. You're likely going to stress out the entire support team. You, you know, there's, there's likely going to be, um, you know, you could be uh, setting yourself up for failure because you're going to get all of your time sucked by this one customer because of the way that the contract has been signed. You might not be able to renew them in the future. So we had another term which was like scorched earth contracts where some sales guy had gone in and sold for three years on some low uh, value and then the next person who was given the territory couldn't do anything with it anymore. And so, uh, so yeah, it was a big, it was a big problem. Uh, I think the thing that solved it for me, and this is the only, this is the, this is the way that I managed to get over that, was by running a bootstrapped <laughs> service company, where I actually had to live and die by the margins I was making from the delivery of the services. And I learned very quickly around what it took to make profit without any financial backing whatsoever. And so that's the way that I learned it. But for, for, for people who are in companies that are, you know, got loads of, loads of money, VC-backed money, uh, the salespeople aren't that closely connected to the engineers. I think that's a really important thing. Build, build a, a culture where the engineers, the support team, and the, and the salespeople work in really close concert. I think that's really important. But it's still, it, it sounds good, but I'd still say, on, on the whole, when I, when I speak to friends who are still in sales, software sales, that, that doesn't really happen. And I think it's something that's really, 
really important to sort of keep a keep a close eye on. I would say I don't know if anyone's got any experience of this themselves. Well, yeah, what I wanted to add, like uh, from uh, my uh, standpoint, right? Uh, then uh, you have uh, uh, the founder with like no sales experience involving in uh, in sales. Uh, mistakes uh, are, are going to be made, and there are going to be deals where you won't make any money. There are going to be deals where you make a promises which you would not be able to keep. But I think this is important <laughs> part of the education, yeah. right? I think uh, uh, that is very uh, valuable, and that is good if it's done in an early stage, right? Then uh, things are probably is not <laughs> that uh, that serious yet. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, with my COO hat on, it's basically these sort of problems are solved by process. Like basically, we've gone into it and we've been burned by it. So basically, it's like you set up a process and you make sure that you have visibility on the resources we have, etc. And that's one of the reasons we um, actually have some uh, licensing, like some products we can license, is because we don't want to be a service company because it's not scalable. And then you, the planning in terms of hiring, etc. same mm -hmm. thing, we've got burned by it uh, last year. It's really tough. So uh, yeah, you, when you're small, then as the founder, you should be involved and know what you're selling and how. When you're big, you just need the process. In terms of overcommitment on the product side of things, it's another interesting aspect, which is quite different, where basically, uh, you, as a founder, you're out there, you have a customer, they want a specific feature, and it's going to help you drive your roadmap because it may be a big logo, and yes, of course, of course I have it. And by the time you've signed the contract, then at least you've started up. We had um, a big debate last year again where trying to sell to uh, big aeronautical logos, and uh, of course we had this feature, no problem at all. And then when the co contract is eventually signed, the thing is barely in beta. And the sales guys were like, what, it's not ready? But it's also part of the game, right? The customers are driving you forward and you build with them and you make them part of your team and say, yeah, we have it. It's not fully ready, but it means that I can do this and this and you're going to help us shape it. So it's, founders are over committing the company. I uh, have so many times this discussion in the last year. It's incredible, like both product, professional services, etc. But you need to, uh, like some bits of it are dangerous. Over committing teams is really dangerous. The best way to kill your company. Uh, over committing your product is not that bad. And not uh, like yesterday, we had our sales kickoff, and our VP sales was saying, yeah, pre-sales, they're going to do the demos, etc." And my co-founder jumped in and said, by the way, if the product is not ready, you have to bring the team, uh, the customer along, and make them part of the game, and it's going to help us, blah, blah, blah. And then the VP sales was, but that's undermining what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... I still truly believe that sometime as a, as a founder, you have to overcome it to make the company move forward. That's I, part of the whole thing. I've yeah. been trying to think whilst uh, Amanda's been talking around practical advice, and I'd say we've, so we've talked about process, culture, I think communication, again, communication between all the teams to make sure everyone's aligned on what can get delivered. But one uh, practical thing that we did do, and I've, I've just, I was just remembering as, as you were talking, was that we went early days with the customer. The customer got overexcited, you know, we, and they would say, we want this, and we got overexcited. And so, um, so they said, we'll give you $100,000. And uh, I'd be like, amazing. Like, that's, the, that's the most amount of money that we've ever sold, ever. And then we like, we'd go back and we'd, and we'd discuss it. We're like, how on earth are we going to deliver on this? Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing actually was that saying, it's great that you want to give us $100,000, but why don't we like uh, create a, a milestone or a checkpoint where you can pay us $30,000 and we'll do these things first and we'll, see yeah. how, we'll test out the, the relationship. We'll see if we can get over those milestones. And then you can really, like, don't, don't, by all means, go and get the budget for that $100,000. Make sure it's ring fence and it's there so we can use it. Mm -hmm. But let's together just like sort of chunk up the, proje uh, the project or the, or the contract. This is early days when, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the resources we had were so threadbare, basically. We had to really be careful. Uh, and that's, that's one of the ways I was just remembering that we, we did it early days just to kind of test, test our ability to deliver as much as anything else. Yeah, and I feel like I, I might have kind of uh, uh, misinterpreted because I thought we'd talk about open, open the, the overcommitting more to the open source side and how much of it is open versus commercial. Uh, but on these, you know, I think these are all kind of great advice. I, I think like through a journey of a company, and this is open source or not related, because this, this is not an open source conversation, right? it's like generally like an entrepreneurship. Um, 
is uh, I think there's features that get you into a deal, there's features that get you through a POC, and there's features that make a customer successful. Mm -hmm. And the reality of sort of entrepreneurship is that there's hustle involved and there's some sort of, you know, wink and nod that you do need to sort of uh, 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 dance with. Uh, and there's, a, there's hopefully through the life of your company a transition from uh, uh, more of a bias for the former yeah. into more of a bias for the latter. Uh, uh, but you do need to kind of do those because if you don't get, like if everything you're building is around long-term successful sort of, uh, and so sometimes the overcommitment is also a little bit in, in that. And so like, I think naturally, if you're sort of investing in features that would just sort of help you sell, you might not have built the things around it. You know? yeah. And that, those might kind of come out in commitments. There's a very big difference between commitment in contracts and commitment uh, verbally. Of course, you want to be straightforward with customers. Of course, you want to sort of, you know, like there is a long-term trust and relationship you want to build with them. Um, but I'd still sort of guide people where, like, you can't be agile and sort of end up sort of locking up all of your uh, roadmap. So whether it's overcommitted or correctly sized, you just, you, you, you have to preserve agility um, in any, uh, any kind of young business that is kind of aimed to grow. And so, uh, so I'd say, you know, expectation and commitment are two different things. And while, of course, you want to manage expectations, you want to really super tightly manage legal commitments. Um, yeah. I think you've had us also on the interesting thing, right? If you are, let's say, small, very young startup set into enterprise, that is probably not a first Radeo, right? And they are kind of uh, expecting what you are this kind of a very eager founder who doesn't know what they're doing, right, and most likely overcome it, right? So often they do not expect what you would actually deliver 100% on the timeline. Well, you yeah, are, but sometimes, uh, like, from my experience, they could take advantage of that as well, honestly, and, and they don't care as long as they're getting what they need. Sometimes they don't really know. They're sometimes like, they no, know. we absolutely yeah. need this, otherwise exactly. we don't close exactly. the deal in three months in. Yeah. It's like, actually, you know what, that doesn't really yeah. matter. And then, so that's and why if it's in expectation, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's if right. it's yeah. in contract, yeah. I mean, uh, of course, you want to be, uh, you want to be careful, but I think the other side, right, and uh, like I think there are some people who are uh, uh, very kind of Promise, promise, promise. On the other hand, there are like some engineers who are kind of too reserved. Well, uh, oh, yeah. unless <laughs> that code is, you know, ready, and I already yeah. tested that for five years, yeah. I can't promise that. that. Well, you know what, that is yeah. way too conservative. I, you need a balance. I learned very early in my career not to bring engineers into pre-sales calls, because uh, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is effectively what I got uh, many, many times. But um, yeah, on the enterprise thing, the other thing, I, I, the number of times, again, you're bringing back all these memories now, is of like, it, like going through these long negotiations as a, you know, being absolutely like, um, all my brain was, was tied up in sort of cash flow. Um, and uh, and like getting an opportunity for the first enterprise, going through all of this like negotiation, putting all my time on that, getting to sign the contract, and then the payment terms were ninety days. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm a brand new like start, like startup with that's bootstrapped, that's got you know fifty grand in the bank. How on earth am I going to live for <laughs> for ninety days? So like I, I kind of um, I, I ended up uh, effectively um, actually not doing deals with some of the enterprises and focusing more on smaller companies where I could do lower risk, smaller contracts that were fixed price, and I could actually then effectively have the team uh, deliver multiple projects, and and we kind of spread the load by doing fixed price contracts until we built up enough of a you know, a backstop of revenue, or sorry, uh, c cash, basically, to then risk a couple of those bigger enterprise deals. And even then, I'll be managing the risk of, of sort of like the milestones and chunking them up and so on. But yeah, there's, there's, a, lot, there's, a, lot, there's a, lot to, a lot to think about, yeah. Uh, okay, great. So hey, can I was here and co-founder at Ivan. That was a, a good discussion. I just wanted to add a couple of points there. Most of them were covered on, on the panel already. But overcommitting, I think that's um, something that happens on a hustle when you're, especially on the early days. And I think that's a part of the finding the vision and high tuning the, the product. You need to have then the process when the organization grows and then it cannot deliver on all the crazy promises from the founders. <laughs> but I think it's, it's also, it's important in a, in a sense to do, to build those very early customer relationships because that gives you then the, that goes into the territory of, of kind of locking in your customers with love uh, kind of so that they you have a partnership rather than vendor supplier relationship and that can really help to kind of 
both focus your product and then kind of make sure that you have some recurring revenue from those very early customers. It's important to, for any commitments that you do to your customers, you have to be very careful that it ties back to a common vision so you don't do snowflakes or offshoots out of the main vision because those will slow you down. But if it's something that is kind of that you understand that it's something that needs to be done, uh, then prioritize your work. Make sure that the, the customers are happy and then you build that uh, goodwill. Yeah, it, was, it will also bring you another really useful channel for selling, which is case study. And then you can take, because community is great, and then if you add to that the actual customers going out there and vouching for you, that's gold dust. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I would actually, again, any uh, new founders, every time you do a piece of work, write it up uh, straight away. Because mm -hmm. actually we find it hard because we're so focused on just trying to make money and move into the next project that we kind of forget to write it up and actually you know, document it. Because then you know, you, you do, all it needs is one person in the organization that's good at then turning it into a blog post or a case study mm -hmm. or so on. That yeah. You can start to use those assets. Ask ChatGPT about it. Ask oh, ChatGPT. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Any other, any other questions? Hey, uh, so out of curiosity, when or how do you know when you're ready to hire that first salesperson or that sales-oriented person on the team? And then, of course, you know, on the topic of open source, how technical do they need to be? When? It's basically when you cannot do it anymore, I would say. But at some point, you are not scalable. So you need support. The other thing is if you want to start building a proper... Um, uh, how do you say? Uh, um, I've lost the word. Uh, productize sales funnel, and if you have your VC backed, you will have pressure for that pretty early on. And in that case, if you're not a sales person or a marketing person who has anything to understand, like cannot understand it, then you need bringing someone who actually knows how to do it is super useful. That's how we lived it, at least. I think the um, uh, the sales w once you put a salesperson kind of in like have them do the work the, the sort of the initial work then you lose uh, some of the information that might come back so to me it's really about your sort of level of confidence of how much you're doing it so it's about you have to have closed a bunch of deals and you have to sort of feel like your sales calls are becoming increasingly repetitive. Uh, and I think that's a good time to sort of, you know, bring a, bring a salesperson. Uh, and and I, I, I've actually lived like at Sneak and also uh, seen kind of a bunch of startups, the value of the advice of bring two. Uh, and, you know, I like it. This sort of general concept is like bring two salespeople because otherwise if they don't sell, you don't know if it's the salesperson that's a problem or your product. You know, is it, is it like who's, who's, at, who's at fault? And, and also, especially if you're sort of not familiar with, selling, with hiring salespeople, and if you bring people with different styles, you sort of see what works for you and what works for the product. Uh, it definitely worked for us. We brought two salespeople, parted ways with one after sort of uh, two or three months. And uh, it was actually pretty clear cut from two weeks in, but we just yeah. sort of gave it a bit longer. Um, and I've seen it work with a variety of startups that I've invested in. Um, and, and in terms of the technical uh, piece, like it, it depends. Like, um, uh, I'm, I'm a bit conflicted kind of in this, and it depends on how technical the value proposition is. So if you are entirely technical and kind of, you know, where you're sort of approaching, then, you know, you do need some amount of ability to even understand and kind of, you know, regurgitate <laughs> the message to it. However, I do think that there's a difference between a salesperson and an SE. Uh, and I think the most important skill of the salesperson is to identify the need for value, to do the deal making, to build the relationship, to sort of drive that. And that's why solution engineers exist, and they need to be able to have the technical conversations. And it's very likely at the beginning, you're the SE. You know, like the founder is the SE. You're kind of coming along to doing it. Uh, and I was the SE of our sort of uh, sales team for, for a good while. And it's okay. It's, um, uh, and, and so I'd, I'd sort of say like it's, it's valuable that the salesperson is, uh, you know, has some tech jobs. But you should just be careful not to make that the primary attribute. It's very easy as a technical founder to kind of be more fond of, as you sort of interview people, the people that have the bigger tech depth, because you sort of have more affinity. That's not how you should assess them. Just, I'd like to answer that question. But before I do, Peter, you have to go to another session or presentation. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to say thank you. OK, very thank, much you. For uh, thank you, folks.
uh, I think uh, the, the, way that, uh, the way it worked out for, for me is that uh, I was uh, obviously in sales and then um, my co-founder was in pre-sales at Mongo. So like, we, we, we were able to do it for a lot longer than maybe you otherwise probably would have done because we were doing it. But like, the, the moment for me was just when the volume of like, potential opportunities just became too much for me to handle uh, myself. And when I was looking for a salesperson, I was absolutely terrified of making that hire because I know salespeople, <laughs> and I know you can get very good ones, and you can, there's a, but there's a lot of maybe not so good ones out there. And I was also very concerned that um, when you're in deep tech or open source, there's not a great pool, especially not in the UK, of people that really know that space. So I actually waited longer than I otherwise might have done and found someone who'd had at least experience and background in open source uh, software and services. And uh, it's worked out great, and he's been with us now for three years and is now director of sales. But um, I did not take that, uh, that decision lightly. But for me, it was like it was just when. Because when. I think that, as, as you were saying, uh, as a founder, you should be doing the sales and the pre sales for as, as, long as, 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 as long as you can, really. And, and that's what we did. And it just got to the point where you know, I just ran out of time to be able to do it, basically. Um, and then once you hire that person, don't, um, don't think that they're going to solve your problems. They take a long time to ramp. And so you can't be expecting they're going to be making, you know, making your annual number. Um, like we, we basically had a, a long ramp up period, and um, and Cameron spent a lot of time in all of our meetings. So I continued to be the salesperson, and you know, working with the pre-sales, like my, my co-founder for a long time, as, as Cameron sort of sat in and, and effectively just shadowed for for probably six months before he could do it himself. Yeah, yeah. we still uh, come up in some sales pitch, also because it's VIP, right? VIP customers, you like to have the founder actually coming in. And another thing on the technicality, I think we went also for, for quite technical salespeople because uh, of this whole, like, um, uh, worried about too slimy salesy, and also because we're really strong on making sure we're very strong technically, and we want this as part of our image. So we want to make sure that the salesperson is capable, capable of answering some technical question because that's part of who we are and mm -hmm. our image. Yeah. I've just I've been burned the other way around as well because if you go for the sort of the deal making skills, and you have some tech jobs, you can actually get in trouble the other way around because like you want a salesperson that knows when their sort of tech jobs are done mm. and they delegate to the SE. And I've actually I think the worst case is when they when they kind of outstep their expertise and they represent something. Yes. I don't think yeah. there's actually any points lost when a salesperson says, like, you know what, I don't know this, but let me get the solution engineer. And in fact, like, the solution engineers are oftentimes more important you know, than, the, uh, than the salespeople and are sort of, you know, cherished and maintained, and by the way, harder to hire uh, doing it because they have this sort of unique combo of skills. But, you know, back to sort of maybe uh, your question before, is they need to be good at selling, but they don't need to do deal making. Mm -hmm. So the solution engineers, they need to get the customer to fall in love with the product. They need to be able to answer all the technical deep, technically deep questions. And that's why at the beginning, that's yeah. the founder. The, the beginning of the founder needs to be the deal maker as well. And so to me, the combo is like, I don't want overlap between them. I want enough for a common language, but I don't want overlap. You know, what I want is the sort of the... Yep. The, the, the other person to be an amazing deal maker to be able to like figure it out and um, and the best salespeople you know I've sort of seen of I've, I've really only lived in sort of only worked with sort of really quite highly technical products um, and the best salespeople were like not a technical bone in their body you know like no no idea <laughs> you know like you put them in front of the product and we we considered like you know running them through like a like a coding workshop you know for empathy and all of that and and just, it just ends up, it's like, look, it's a different, very hard, very valuable skill to have. And that's what we optimize for, and everything else is gravy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, culture fit, of course, for the company and all that, you have to have that, but, you know, which also in sales you have to be very mindful of. But, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, just going back to the governance, I would say, uh, just wondering whether um, Blockchain solutions have been used for um, governance of um, open source uh, projects and also for um, uh, generating initial capital, whether that's been looked at as a business model, um, if, if you know. I'm going to do the sales thing now and say I don't know much about that, so I'm going <laughs> to hand over to, to one of my panelists, to, if, if anyone's aware of. Yeah, we haven't... Uh... We haven't used token. We have two of our investors actually got their uh, money from doing ICOs, but we, yeah, we focused on building our own 
decentralized comp, which was hard enough, rather than getting stuck into this sort of things. There are some projects looking at governance and this sort of things, but uh, yeah, we we haven't get involved in got involved in. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, I think it's like discussed, but I haven't actually sort of seen it done at scale. I think you have to separate between the voting mechanism and um, and maybe like decentralized. Um, uh, you know, like it's complicated, like who gets how many tokens, how many votes, and all of that, and, and, and how do you run it, which kind of moves you to more of a democratized, almost like a DAO that sort of uh, that, that runs an open source project. And I think I think there's a confusion between voting, like you still need leadership, you know, there's a confusion, like fine, you can have all these different voting mechanisms. It's like a shareholder, like you can have a shareholder kind of pool, but most of the decisions are going to be made by the exec team and then approved by the board, and only a subset, a very small subset of them will come to the shareholders. And I, I think it's, it's a little bit like that uh, here, right? Like, you know, in practice, the decisions, most of the decisions are made by the developers writing the sort of the open source project, and then there's the governing entity, whether it's a corporate or a foundation, and I think a better, I think blockchain really only kicks in when you talk about how do I consult the, uh, the broader community um, um, in, in a way that is more than surveys and sort of uh, those types of voting mechanisms. But yeah, yeah it's I'm, interesting to watch. I'm not sure if you were in the session this morning, but one of the things that's come out of these, yeah. these couple of days for me is that there have been quite a few questions around this, this area. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions this morning is whether you could maybe incentivize your community with um, crypto or you know, um, you know, some kind of token. And, uh, and uh, I know that a couple of people in the audience this morning were actually actively looking at, looking at that. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's not something I know much about. It's not something I've ever thought about. But I think one of the things I'll be doing after this is, is actually just exploring it a little bit more. Because it's clearly uh, something that people are, are thinking about. I think we're being hailed that we're out of time. OK. So. <laughs> cool. Yeah, OK, guys. Um, thank you very much. Can you join me in thanking our panelists? Thank you.